Good morning and welcome to this Facebook Live uh, coming to you from the Starling Hotel in Geneva. My name is Chris Gota. I'm part of the communications team at IATA, the International Air Transport Association. And we're here at the uh, Sustainable Aviation Summit, which is run by the Air Transport Action Group. It's a yearly summit looking at sustainability issues. And we've just come from the main plenary room, uh, hearing uh, a session looking at the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which is um, a hugely important set of targets and goals for the world. Um, which the UN have set up. And I have with me uh, a distinguished panel of guests um, to talk about these goals in the context of aviation and what air transport is going to do to help the world reach these goals. And we'll go through some of those goals over the next 30 minutes. So uh, thank you for joining us and thank you for joining me today. Um, so I'm going to start by asking uh, you all to introduce yourselves uh, for our audience. If I could start on my father, and um, Dirk, if you could introduce yourself and perhaps also give an example of the most fun or most interesting or most exotic place you've ever flown to. Yeah, you said so. My, my name is Dirk Glesa. I'm the director with the World Tourism, uh, World Tourism Organization. I'm the director for sustainable tourism development there. And when you asked me that question, my first thought was, what is exotic? And exotic is actually for me something which might not be the general perception. I live in Spain, I lived there for a long time, I have sunshine each and every morning I get up, there is hardly rain. For me, my dream destination is going back home to the Baltic Sea, where we have wind, where we have rain, where we have lighthouses, where I enjoy uh, with the family a completely green environment where, uh, where I relax. So for, for me, this, this exotic means the other thing. Great, thank you. Yeah. Right, hi, so I'm Gail Clintworth. I'm uh, with the Business Commission for Sustainable Development, which is trying to get business to drive for the SDGs. And I'm partner at a company called Systemic. I'm South African, come from Africa. My, I've got so many places that I love, but one of my best is when I can get a little plane from Nairobi and fly to Mombasa so that I can go to, in Kenya, so I can go to Kalifi, Bofa Beach, which is one of my favorite places in the world, and just chill out in African nature. Wow, that sounds fantastic. Thank you very much. Kati. Yes, I'm Kati Yamati from Frenair, uh, looking after sustainability, so director for corporate sustainability. On top of that, I'm um, board member of Plan Finland, so looking at the SDGs on that perspective as well, as, as well as uh, Finnish Business and Society board member, so sustainable development is pretty family, familiar to me. But what comes to the exotic or favorite places, there are so many of them, and I completely relate to what you said, but for me, exotic was yesterday when I arrived, I went to have an evening dip at Van de Parquy, the Geneva Lake, so I went swimming there. It was completely dark. I was there with ducks and, and, uh, and the, uh, the swans. People were jumping off from sauna as well. That was exotic, even for me, coming from the, in the city center. I am impressed because it, it can be pretty cold in LA, even, uh, even late Well, summer, coming so. from Finland, you know, <laughs> nothing is cold. Excellent, thank you. And for my answer, uh, yes, of course, the whole world to choose from is very difficult, but I do have a wonderful memory of going to Iceland. Um, for my wife's, um, I took her there for uh, a master birthday of my wife. I went to see the age to spare her, but uh, yes, and uh, we had a wonderful time in Iceland. So that, that certainly stands out for me as one particular place. Okay, so. Um, looking at sustainable development and the sustainable development goals, I think what we heard um, in the uh, session that we've just come from was that um, it's really not about a list of things that aviation helps with or doesn't help with. It's about creating aviation as the sustainability of your everyday existence and business and how you um, motivate your employees and all of these elements. So my first question I suppose I would put, and I'll perhaps start with you, Carti, as a representative of the aviation industry, is do you believe that sustainability is part of the industry's DNA enough? I think it is, and I, I just got this great publication in my hand and I was kind of uh, contributing to that as well. 
And I think it was great. I think it's the first industry who has really, as an industry, done something like this. And it's to show really that the idea we are capable of, of answering to every 17 SDGs in a way or another. And um, I kind of shared, I think it was a great panel, but I kind of shared the idea, the part of, or I, I, I remember the part when, when somebody had said that they felt a bit hesitant to come to the panel because you have to usually uh, defend the industry. But now it's completely the other way around. And I attended this summer the uh, high-level political forum and high-level business forum for SDTs in New York with thousands of delegates and then it was a great event. And there I was kind of ready to defend the industry once again. But I heard the, uh, the uh, speech from one, uh, one of the representatives coming from the developing countries and they said that we cannot develop without aviation industry. We extremely, we need uh, aviation in order to develop in the future. And that kind of gave me already be like, okay, I'm here and we can contribute. And, and this is the good, good uh, example of how we can relate to all, all different SDGs. And, uh, so I think it's in our, in our DNA. In We've been concentrating a lot, defending ourselves for the climate. And we still have to do, we need to reduce our environmental impact, that's for sure. But we can also contribute on the social and economical side and kind of balance the whole uh, the, uh, the effect of the, uh, or effect of the, uh, the industry in that sense. And Dirk, you, your particular specialism, I believe, is, is tourism in, in this sense. And um, so do you believe that, that aviation um, has sustainability in its DNA to the same extent that perhaps the tourism industry has had to embed that in its DNA? It's, um, I would start with a <coughs> reflection related to, to where we both come from. Um, that in the past there, um, there is a very strong dependence on you know, aviation, but uh, at the same time, the, the tourism sector and aviation not always have uh, aligned their policies, <coughs> meaning that they, they actually presented their cases in a different format. Very often, very often using just the economic argument, and that's what I said during the panel as well, 10, 15 years ago. Um, the sector used the economic argument, said we need this and that and that because it's producing this and that economic impact. Um, that was lobbying. That is fine. It's, it's, it's part of lobbying that you try to provide the evidence. But nowadays we are in a situation where this, this happens differently. No, no, no longer we, we just see that an economic argument is presented, but holistic arguments uh, looking, looking much wider at the different impact an action has. And these actions you only can realize when you are talking to others outside of your goldfish bowl. And that is what we are doing here. And I saw and I'm an eyewitness of ATAC having gone that way. And starting from an economic argument, now looking much wider. And what, what we want to achieve is not only using that for the argument, but, but for the true belief that we together can manage and find better, not suboptimal, but optimal solutions. And for that, you will need a lot of dialogue, open dialogue. And that's what we have seen success factors of sustainable development, that you bring up issues without the fear of uh, being caught that these issues might not be resolved because they, they are interlinking. And if we are looking besides this um, classical interlinkages, then we can say we have built a resilient and sustainable approach. Then we have built a truly uh, meaningful partnership uh, which goes beyond the publication. That is fundamental. And dialogue, continuous dialogue, is part of that. Thank you. Uh, we're we're going to come back to that dialogue point, I think, in, in a little bit. But, um, Gail, in terms of, um, you, you have a, a wider perspective of different businesses and, and how they respond to sustainability. <laughs> Where do you place aviation vis-a-vis -vis other businesses? Is it ahead of the game? Is it behind? What's your take okay, on Okay, so I don't know everything that you're doing, right? I think this report, wherever it is, I think this is great. So this is good. The impression that I've got is that you've been completely obsessed with the fuel issue, right? So basically abatement, fuel efficiencies, and alternative fuels. There's a much bigger job to be done, right? That, that is your 
really big Achilles heel, right? And it is your largest contribution, negative contribution <laughs> to the world. So you can't let go of that. And, you know, I've, I've no doubt that that will stay there. But, you know, if I think about the procurement of this industry around the world, I mean, how much do you buy? You must yeah. buy a huge amount, right? I don't know how much sustainable sourcing is built into everything that you do. And I was writing down um, some little ideas, and you know, I was going, why don't you build a plane that has all of the inside made from completely recycled material, and, and material that is straight, you know, fresh from the oceans, for example. Why don't you start doing something that's kind of a little more... Um, a little more exciting than just talking about fuel. I'm going to add one more. Um, I think there is something that we haven't got yet. So here we've got all the sustainability kind of people, right? When I go through a lot of the annual reports for the aviation industry, safety is up front, okay, which it has to be. And then there's something like about carbon over there, but there's not really anything about the role in society as part of the strategy. And I think that's again, is something that you guys could grab. And that, excellent, so I would just like to come to an airline. Tell us about the role of society as you see it then. Well, I, I really see that, and we've been reporting on the whole sustainability since 2009. So it's a kind of long chat, standing job for us. And now actually on Friday, we will have the aviation TRI workshop, trying to find all the different uh, parameters and material issues to us. And like, I, like you said, and I've said before as well, that the uh, supply chain is huge. And we have to look at the supply chain. And for instance, we now joined this SEDEX system in order to trace better our supply chain because we don't buy anything or we don't manufacture anything anymore. So even the services, all the services at the airports are uh, uh, coming from the uh, service providers. So we really have to look at our supply chain as well. But anyway, I, I think, um, and then, like said before, that we are very good working together as an industry. But now we have to step out from that fuel talk only, and, and step out and start talking about the other effects that we have on the on this global world. And, and, and uh, I think we, like like Michael presented that flying information, I think we are very good in that, in cooperating in different aspects, so, so I don't see any problem of us uh, cooperating in the SDGs. And then overall, SDGs are about the cooperation. It's private sector, governments, and the civil society. So we just step as an industry there on the kind of a private sector part, and then cooperate with the governments, which we have to do anyway when we try uh, um, fly around the world, and then working together with the civil society and trying to really map out all the, uh, the uh, different ways that we can contribute. Mm. In your position at Finair, do you find that it's difficult for the rest of the business to kind of lift its mind up from the bottom line? We know that running an airline is a very difficult business to make money in. So um, how, it, it, is that difficult for some people to kind of lift their heads up and, and think about these wider issues? Yeah, but it requires us also to change the language. If we start talking about the SDGs and then completely different language than our business leaders use, it's, it's going to stay in sustainability with the department. So we have to change our language. Really start talking about business as well while we talk about mm -hmm. SDGs. So then it makes it e then that makes it easier. And also what Gay, Gay you told that you did the same kind of exercise with the uh, Unilever about the SDT, so they've done that. Uh, we did a couple of years ago uh, in our report that all our management team members needed to tell what sustainability means in their field. So kind of a similar exercise needs to be done uh, for most of the, uh, the uh, businesses, I guess, in order to get the SDTs really to business relation and then to strategy, business strategy. There shouldn't be a sustainability strategy and business strategy. Right. They need to be combined. But we also have to combine the language. We cannot <coughs> just talk the kind of uh, overall. Chris, in, in, that, in that context, uh, I, I would like to come back on, on, on the DNA question you asked mm -hmm. before, whether the sustainability, sustainability is in the DNA. Um, what, what, what we in the tourism sector now uh, speak about is the local DNA. Um, 
and that links very much with uh, what Kanti was just, just mentioning. Uh, you, you should not see in, in, in tourism the tourism product just as a product on shelf, an economic product. The tourism product is an experience and we, we, want, we want this experience also be a desired experience by the visitors. Uh, what, what we see in many places in the world is if this is not happening and others are just coming to consume and to sightsee, then the local population feels like in a zoo. Mm -hmm. And we don't want that. We don't want that. And it was a long time that in marketing we promoted a place without consultation of the locals. But now it's about the local DNA. The local DNA, knowing the people, knowing what they want, and inviting others to their places to make those experiences. And that links into local sourcing, pre producing then already on the way in to the destination experience, which is different, which is not looking like a hospital when you are entering an airport, where the airport is re uh, re uh, reflecting already what the locals are proud of, what they eat, uh, that the airline tries to communicate these values on board. It must not be just all the time the same, but there you see a, a way of, of communicating what in the end can be sustainable, not necessarily must be, but if sustainability is communicated that way and is lived that way, then it's authentic, then it is something desired. We should not think of just sustainability as another product which is adding, as Kanti is saying, to the desired list and putting it in the worst case just in parallel to the business plan. No, it must be something desired. Okay, maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. In your experience working with the businesses you've worked with, can you think of some good examples where, where there was this um, almost interconnected sense of the business strategy and the environment strategy coming together? So, um, food is probably one that comes to all of our minds, right? Why? Because, well, a whole lot of reasons. First of all, there's uh, a problem with the land that we're using, the amount of food we are producing, and whether we can feed everyone. There's also a problem with the kind of food that we're giving people to eat and the fact that everyone's becoming obese and suffering from diabetes. So the food industry's grabbed hold of this thing because they had to, right? How have they done that? <clears throat> well, let me talk about sustainable sourcing. And let me talk particularly, um, again, so I was involved in running some big um, brands globally, where you can absolutely link the ingredients that are going in to the food that you produce to make sure that they are sustainably sourced right in the local community sometimes sometimes more globally you can then claim that this is made with I don't know sustainable tea sustainably produced tea people who drink it love that idea right and so you completely um, complete what I call the regenerative economic cycle now that again, what you were talking about in terms of, you know, let's, let's have tourism where people don't feel like they're actually the zoo that we're coming to visit. But actually they can benefit from the fact that now you've got an airline coming in, right? And so that becomes a regenerative economic cycle. And the idea, and in some ways it kind of feels a bit of anti-globalization, but I, don't, I think in some ways good, right? We have to make sure that, you know, where we buy, where we source our stuff from, and where we go into, that we actually are leaving something behind and using what people have as resources there to build them up to. And then that becomes regenerative for all of us. So, yes, food, ingredients. So, so what I'm hearing perhaps, and Kelsey, you can maybe talk about this as well from the airline perspective, is that... The airline, if it, it needs to adopt a mindset of being rooted in the communities, not just that it, it's a flag carrier base, mm -hmm. but the communities it flies to. And, and think about those communities it's flying to, the people at the other end, and um, not just the people that they're in, in the plane, but the communities that, that are, uh, they're reaching out to. And if, you, if perhaps an airline can start to think of it in those terms, it will start to think about this wider supply chain and, 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 and the tourism issues that we talked about. It, does that make sort of sense? Yeah, and I, I think in that sense we are kind of going backwards as in, kind of, uh, in this world because it used to be that if you had a factory 
you took care of the environment, you took care of the people that you were your employees, their families, you probably created schools in that area and so on. So I think we kind of have to go back in, in our mindsets in that way, that we really have to think about the communities. It's not only the business relationship, but you really have to, and that creates also goodwill. And then, so you might get the best people to work for you, you get the customers from that area, you get better relationship with the governments, if you really contribute to that society also where you fly to or where you operate. Because you know, as an airline, you need good um, dialogue with the government also if you are planning to operate in some countries. And this helps us in that dialogue as well. So, so it's not only the being so, so green at heart or being so, so good uh, world citizen or, or a corporate citizen, it's only it makes business sense as well. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you are hiring local people there at the airport, if they value your airline also contributing to that society, I think they will be better workers as well in that sense, if, if, if I'm putting this plan bluntly, but yeah. So, Chris, if, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I just can reflect on, on both Alan uh, Gales and Candy's uh, ideas and and uh, especially for our audience, in the tourism sector, participatory planning is very important. It's very often forgotten. It's a very traditional principle. Participatory means that you engage the stakeholders mm -hmm. and you talk to the stakeholders, that you ask them first, what do you want? Uh, and then you, you see the feasibility. You agree on the feasibility of, of, of that. And then later on, you see, did we achieve what you wanted or not? And um, th this is one fundamental uh, principle which uh, you can uh, include in the product development mm. and the services you are offering. There is no just this solution because sustainability above all in tourism is context sensitive. Context sensitive means uh, it, a solution which works in Finland doesn't work yeah. in Spain. A yeah. solution in, in the rural area doesn't work for the city. Mm -hmm. So that context makes it that we cannot come in with prescriptive models. The only thing which is prescriptive is that the governance model as such must follow a participatory approach, an evidence-based approach. And there, there it comes, Gatti, when you send lo local sourcing, you can also source globally, but if you know the footprint, you need the information related to the goods you are purchasing. So far in the tourism sector, we're using your certification mechanisms, certifying that these products have met this and that levels. But, um, we want more. We want in the end not only just a minimum standard, what we want is developing authentic experiences mm -hmm. and excelling above that, but reliable. So, so this is currently the process and coming back to the SDGs, there's where the whole SDG discussion proves to be now catalytic for governments, whether national or regional, for sectors, economic sectors and industries. Uh, it is coming to all our uh, mindsets how important it is to think beyond the pure economic argument, be, beyond the lobbying, and to show that this is a huge opportunity for all of us societies to develop further, while at the same time enjoying travel, enjoying the possibility to, to feel through tourism self-fulfillment, which is very important besides the economic, uh, um, economic importance the tourism sector has but showing that we are structuring in a participatory approach, in a logical evidence-based approach of the sustainability agenda. So Gail, just looking to the future, um, do you worry that uh, the industry, not just necessarily the aviation industry, but specifically the aviation industry, um, is not getting on top of this sufficiently and that therefore governments are going to act, particularly some Western governments, um, to restrict uh, aviation travel. Is that something you worry about? Is that something that you, you think would, would, would be a, a bad thing for, for the development or the achievement of some of these other goals? And um, if that's not the case, what should aviation be doing to make sure that it's, uh, it's putting its message out there? Okay, so um, I, I don't know about governments acting to restrict. I think the, the, the real risk of major carbon taxes and a, um, a tax or, or 
traveller um, uh, levy to fund climate finance is a, is a very real, and I won't even call it risk, you know, sometimes I actually think it should happen, right? I think that extern, internalising external costs is really probably the only way the whole world's going to get that together. <laughs> and that's not only in um, ecosystem services and carbon, but also social, a social quotient, right? Because we all talk about we create all these wonderful jobs, but we also know that half the reason why people are writing in all parts of the world is that they left out, right? So, we, you know, the world's going to have to fix that, right? So, so that's the first thing. What, what should aviation do? It was very interesting, Katie's saying, we have to go backwards, right? I'm thinking we need to remember the okay. So we need to remember why business exists. So I'm not going to use aviation now, right? I'm going to use insurance. So I spent some time working in the insurance business. And I had to remind them, actually the reason you exist at all, right, was because in the olden days, individual people could not uh, pay for their own insurance. So they pooled together. And they pulled together, formed a mutual society where they put their money in. And then if one of them had a problem, Everyone paid it out. That got lost because suddenly all of these middlemen came in, making lots and lots of money out of it, and forgot about why you're there. You're there to service the people who need financial services in a way that you're making their lives easier. So I was wondering, as I've listened in the last couple of days, you know, what was that core purpose that the airline industry has? Connecting people, you know, creating what it is. I, I think just getting some of that back and realizing that you're not about metrics, traffic control, you know, planes, but you're actually about providing a real service to society. I think that could be helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You agree with that? Yeah, I, guess. I do. I do. <coughs> I think we, that's our purpose because now it's it's very uh, popular to talk about the purpose, but really we have to find the purpose of it comes through this, it comes through cooperation, but also kind of a remembering our roots and why we exist. Are you optimistic in terms of the technological changes that are coming with the sustainable fuels, with even things like electric planes in the, in the, the distant future? Are you, are, do, you, do you think that matters? or um, I mean, it matters, but do, do you think it, it's important now that we talk about that? Or do we just need to focus on getting right the things we can control now, this, this idea of the participatory... Um, uh, sustainability idea. Where does the balance lie in that debate? I think we, we really have to do that. Even though I said that we have to look back and remember things, but really we have to. And the SDTs are also about us being fit for the future, being able to operate in the future, being able to grow, being able to cooperate. So we really need to work on that end as well, and fiercely as well, because I, I think we need, we need uh, sustainability in environmental matters sooner than later so so that needs to be there and that work needs to continue but now we can also kind of uh, look at the social aspects and then combine those and it's not either or but it's all, all of them together and and, and I, I, I we need this industry cooperation we need the SDG cooperation with the public sector and the other private sectors like the tourism industry and then there's been many good examples of cooperating with different industries and, and, and that's the way for us to go, go further and also taking into account this, uh, this kind of a food chain thing especially when we talk about the biofuels and, uh, mm -hmm. so we have to kind of relate ourselves to this world better than we've probably done before and then I think we well we are in that path and we continue to do that. So you're yeah. optimistic? I'm very optimistic otherwise I wouldn't be here. <laughs> yeah. I have to be optimistic. Yeah. That's good. And I am. Yeah. Doug, I mean, 54% of tourists uh, fly by air, right? So your partnership, this dialogue you talked about at the start um, between between the tourism industry and the aviation industry is absolutely crucial, not just for sustainability issues, but, but for the, the well-being of, of, of the tourism industry. Um, are you optimistic that we've got a strategy in place, a way that we're going to tackle these issues, not just to deliver the SDGs, but, but to genuinely tackle the climate change issue and, and these other areas which are so important? 
I'm, I'm optimistic by nature, but I'm, this doesn't happen on its own. Um, first was that um, two years ago, for the first time, IKEA and our organization hosted a high-level meeting on the occasion of our General Assembly, where uh, we, we discussed both policy uh, silos and at the same time. Climate was naturally a very important, but as I mentioned before, there are uh, many, many other elements which uh, inspire each other's uh, um, action and it was about the, the route development and the, the elements which impede in that efficient routes are developed that they are becoming predictable investments for those who are building the infrastructure and then those who later on operate the planes. There are many, many issues which we normally don't have on the radar. Public health, not to forget, because that can have an enormous impact on destinations, on the way how destinations are affected, how economics are affected, and how public health risks are spread around the world. But let me come back before, when, when you ask the question, are you optimistic about aviation and, 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 and climate? Um, aviation, aviation as such, just imagine in a world where it's not locked into carbon. It's a fantastic mode of transportation. Now, we have to, to see how the issue can be accelerated within the, um, within the aviation sector to unlock your dependence on carbon. There are enormous efforts for us as an outsider we can see in the, in the aviation sector underway uh, where this is happening. However, um, aviation is fundamental for tourism development in small island development states and landlocked countries in remote places. It's very often important for the initial development of tourism in a specific region and then using the multiplier effect for uh, further development. That means for us in the tourism sector we benefit enormously from aviation, a functioning aviation system and uh, a, a good commitment to reduce uh, within the aviation sector to the maximum possible the footprint the sector is producing before being able to switch to carbon neutral uh, modes of plane wh whenever they are. And I hear differing uh, statements whether they start in 10 years or in 50. And I congratulated Kati before for the report Finnair produced on their 75th anniversary where they looked not back. There she looked ahead. How is aviation <laughs> looking in 75 years from now? A very inspirational, a very inspirational report. And Canty, my, my wish, I formulated it before, now in front of the community. Do that again. It is fantastic. This kind of thinking helps us to leave the ball. Now, but in general, there's a lot of tourism also happening on the ground, especially domestic tourism, which is not reflected in those figures. And then we need to look for the right transportation mix. There we have on earthbound transportation much better possibility to get carbon neutral before and allowing their, um, the, the aviation sector, uh, while they are doing their very More best. Time. Well, I don't want to give the time for free, yeah? but, no. but basically, uh, basically saying, that tourism is not just about long-haul travel and that tourism is, is about many modes of transportation. Um, that it is the responsible mix of these transportation modes. That it is not flying overseas just for a day and then returning what is good tourism. No, that should be an, a form of, of, of uh, uh, discovering, really using the time to discover a place. And, and with that, we, we have had a completely different experience, cost relationship, rather than that we are just making that as a, as a trip, which is uh, limited in time and limited in experiences, but the same in the carbon footprint. These are just some few of the, the remarks which go into that. It's a huge discussion, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm confident. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, witnessing now uh, a change of the industry for in the, in the past 10 years. I'm very happy for having seen that and for being part of that. And from what I heard so far, there is a lot of commitment and a commitment to, to continue doing that. Thank you. And okay, Gail, a final word for you. Um, are you optimistic given what you've seen? You've come slightly cold to the aviation debate. You've been open about that. You've been following other sectors. Um, what's your final take on what you've seen today and uh, where we should be going next? So I think I, it's great that you're having this conversation, so that's super. Um, 
the, the carbon thing is going to, the carbon and alternative fuels in different is going to have to be solved at some point. You know, whether the people in this room can do it, don't know. So I think keep going with that. I think for the, um, I want to leave three thoughts, if I could, right? So the one is, um, when you think about what you're doing, think about the concept of the shields we need to put in place because of the harm we cause in the world, okay? But the swords that we can drive forward with in terms of the positive difference we can make. And if you think about that, right, you can do some really great stuff. The second is think about three arisings, right? So for everyone out there, I would imagine a lot of people are working on the ground, right? And we can all worry about, think about what can I do now? And what can I do next? And what can I do next? Within those swords and shields. And you know, you can very, very quickly unlock growth opportunities, cost-saving opportunities, and purpose-driven opportunities within that. And then the third thing, you all talk about small island states. I want to just leave the thought that many of the small island states we're talking about will disappear. So just in case you guys think that this is all a nice little conference in the middle of Geneva, actually, the issues that we have to solve are really significant. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's a very good uh, sobering thought on which to leave if we don't tackle this issue. Indeed, the, the sea level rises could well threaten those areas. So um, thank you all very much. I just want to leave uh, the audience with a couple of points. The documents that were referred to, Flying in Formation, which has been released by the Air Transport Action Group, I urge you to go and see that. And also, um, this discussion has been in the context of the future of the airline industry 2035, which is a report that IATA released earlier this year. Find it on IATA. Dot org. Uh, I want to thank you all again for your time. Thank you to our audience, and I hope you found this an interesting debate on the future of the Sustainable Development Goals and Aviation. Thank you. <laughs>